We go to liberate and not to conquer. We will not fly our flags in their country. We are into Iraq to free a people. It is my foremost intention to bring every single one of you out alive. But there may be people amongst us who will not see the end of the campaign. It's a serious thing to lead men into battle. Soldiers are tough. They know the risks of their job, but often they're young and no one wants to die. The enemy should be in no doubt that we are his nemesis and we are bringing about his rightful destruction. A good commander will find a way of binding troops together on the eve of battle, of encouraging them, of giving them confidence and of making sure they know what it is they're fighting for. I know of men who have taken life in other conflicts needlessly. I can assure you they live with a mark of Cain upon them. In August 1942, here in the Egyptian desert, a commander from Ulster gave a master class in this art of leadership. His name was Bernard Law Montgomery, and he's one of the most celebrated and controversial Ulstermen in history. But Monty isn't the only Irishman who made his name in the desert. With him fought Claude Auchinleck of Enniskillen, Eric Dorman Smith from Cavan, and Alan Brooke from County Fermanagh. Occasionally they were allies, often they were bitter enemies, but they were all Alstom. I'm Tim Collins, and I'm a soldier from Ulster too, and I want to know more about the Ulstermen who won the Second World War. By July 1942, Carrow was in a panic. News had reached here that the German Panzer Army was hot in the heels of the 8th Army comprising British and Commonwealth troops. British diplomats were burning papers and the Royal Navy had evacuated the nearby port of Alexandria. A curfew was imposed. It only seemed a matter of time before Erwin Rommel and the veterans of his Desert Army were marching through the gates of the city. Rommel's advance in Cairo was the culmination of a series of devastating victories he had scored against the 8th Army since the start of the year. In June, he defeated the 8th Army at Gazala in Libya, and then taken the port city of Tobruk. By the start of August, he was only 150 miles west of Alexandria. All across the globe, the war was going badly for the British and a German victory in the desert seemed inevitable. The man in charge of the retreating 8th Army was Elsterman Claude Auchinleck, Commander-in-Chief of the Middle East. He was now in personal charge of the 8th Army, after sacking his second general in eight months. In June 1942, Claude Auchinleck stood here on the Dabba Road and watched his 8th Army flood past him in retreat. He knew what the loss of Egypt would mean to the British. He knew it would mean the loss of the Mediterranean Sea to the Axis powers. And he knew that Rommel could attack Russia from the south. And that would mean loss of control of Iran and Iraq and its valuable oil supplies. In effect, he knew it would mean losing the Second World War. It was perhaps the darkest day of his distinguished military career. And yet he was optimistic, for even as his army passed in retreat, he had worked out a plan that would prevent Rommel getting any further. Auchinleck had devised this new strategy with his chief of staff, Major General Eric Dorman Smith from County Cavan. Before the war, this young soldier, known to everyone simply as Chink, was widely regarded as one of the most original thinkers in the British Army. 
Eric Dorman Smith was always bubbling with ideas. He would work up 10 plans faster than anybody else. The problem was that nine of those plans would be positively dangerous and only the, the tenth would be brilliant. Uh, and neither uh, Dorman Smith uh, nor often the people that worked with him were able to work out which plan was the brilliant one. But with brilliance went abrasiveness. Many of Chink's fellow officers simply detested him. He could be aggressive, he could take the mickey out of the more conventional plodding soldiers around him. He would, even if they were really rather thick, uh, ridicule them. And you do not make friends like this. I mean, he was no diplomat. He was the very reverse of any kind of, of establishment creep. But at this moment, Chink's thoughts and those of Ockenleck would shape the defense of the Middle East and determine the future of the war itself. Auchinleck and Dorman Smith set about completely reorganizing the 8th Army, breaking it down into smaller, more mobile units, what they called brigade groups. A brigade group was quite a simple idea. Each brigade of three infantry battalions would have armor, artillery, engineers and anti-aircraft uh, attached to it so that you have a lighter, more flexible unit which can respond uh, to the situation on the, on the battlefield uh, much more rapidly. Auchinleck also wanted to centralize the artillery command structure so that British firepower could be quickly concentrated wherever Rommel advanced. And Eric Dorman Smith hit on the novel idea of concentrating this firepower on Rommel's weaker Italian allies. His idea was that they should dissipate the German um, moves by German troops uh, by attacking the Italians who were not well equipped and not well trained. Auchinleck also decided that the 8th Army would turn and fight here at Al Alamein. Cairo is 200 miles in that direction. This is absolutely the last point on the map from which to defend Egypt. In 1942, this was little more than a dusty rail halt on the way to the Delta, but it provides a defending army with significant advantages. To the south is the Katata Depression, cliffs falling 700 feet to a rocky bottom. To the north is the Mediterranean Sea. This means there's a 40-mile bottleneck through which the Panzer Army must pass on its way to Cairo. As a dispirited 8th Army was starting to rebuild, their German opponents were slowing down. Rommel only had 90 tanks and 6,500 men when he faced the 8th Army at El Alamein for the first time. Many of his troops had come to the battlefront in captured British trucks. He was running out of fuel and at the end of his supply chain. Rommel was falling victim to what military historian Karl von Clausewitz called the culminating point of victory. An army in the attack and on the move had certain advantages, but these would bleed away uh, over time. Rommel uh, has such success at Gazala and Tobruk, uh, he then pursues the 8th Army and he pushes on another 350 miles uh, towards El Alamein. But of course, his supply lines uh, have then been stretched and indeed broken. And at the same time, 8th Army is now resting practically uh, on the Egyptian Delta with all of its supply and support uh, only 60 miles away. The culminating point of victory switches uh, from Rommel the attacker to Auchinleck the defender. Despite a worsening situation, Rommel decides to attack anyway. Cairo, the keys to the Middle East, and his most famous victory are within touching distance. Rommel had noticed before that the 8th Army commanders tended to panic if the Germans got behind their lines. He was gambling that his attack would cause this kind of panic again. But this time, Auchinleck was the man in charge of the 8th Army, and he was ready for Rommel. Don 
dawn on the 1st of July, 1942. As planned, Rommel's Africa Corps headed east to outflank the 8th Army. But at Deir el Shin, a small depression in the desert, they ran into fierce resistance. Here, Indian and South African troops engaged the Germans and held them back. By mid-afternoon, the German advance was halted. Rommel himself was pinned down in the sand, unable to give any orders as artillery shells landed all around him. What you see in this first battle of Alamein is Auchinleck and Dorman Smith gradually winning the initiative back from, from Rommel. Rommel increasingly realising that he is not getting anywhere, increasingly giving way to something approaching real despair. If everyone does his duty in the next 48 hours, we'll lick the blighters properly. We seem to be holding them well. And if they are licked here, they are lost. It's going to be a close-run thing. But in London, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill was impatient for a final decisive victory. He complained bitterly to his army chief, Alan Brooke, from Coolbrook in County Fermanagh. I had an uphill task defending Ockenleck and pointing out the difficulties of his present position. Also, the fact that any rash move in his part at the present time would very quickly lose us Egypt. However, the PM was in one of his unpleasant moods. Alan Brooke had the hardest job of any British soldier in the entire war. But at least he had the pedigree for it. Twenty-six members of the Brooke family had fought in the First World War, and now 27 members of the famous Ulster clan were fighting in the Second World War, but none with the enormous responsibility of Alan Brooke. Not only did he have to control the impetuous Churchill, but he had to devise a strategy to bring the war to successful conclusion. And in the summer of 1942, with defeats in Hong Kong, Singapore, Crete and Tobruk, the task looked impossible. During the last fortnight, I have had, for the first time since the war started, a growing conviction that we are going to lose this war unless we control it very differently and fight it with more determination. I wonder if we shall muddle through this time as we have in the past. There are times when I wish to God I had not been placed at the helm of a ship that seems to be heading inevitably for the rocks. The hopes of Brooke and Britain and the fate of the war itself now lay in Auchinleck's hands. On the 10th of July, Auchinleck's 9th Australian Division attacked Rommel's Italians at El Alamein. Just as Auchinleck and Dorman Smith had planned, Rommel had to move German troops up from the south to help the Italians. At this moment, the war changes. The Germans are on the defensive and the 8th Army are attacking. On the evening of the 13th of July, Auchinleck moved to finish the battle. He ordered the New Zealanders and his Indian troops to attack here on Raisat Ridge. The position was held by the Italians, but not for long. 12,000 men, virtually all their equipment, was soon captured by the 8th Army. Rommel now concentrated on preventing a rout of his army. Cairo and conquest of the Middle East remained out of reach. On 
the battles uh, around El Alamein in July 1942, in many res senses, do mark uh, the high water mark uh, of, of the Axis armies. And after a year of almost unmitigated disasters, the British have finally held the Germans at the gates of Egypt. And psychologically, that's a very important statement for the men of Eighth Army uh, and indeed uh, for the people of, of, of Britain. soldier fighting a battle, your whole life is consumed by that one fight. Nothing else matters to you but achieving the objectives you have been set, that and staying alive. You forget that outside your private battle, a wider war is raging. Hola, hola. In July 1942, Auchinleck won what was to become the first battle of El Alamein but it might as well be known as the Forgotten Battle of Alamein because no one remembers it. The reason for this is a thousand miles north and east of here, far beyond the desert, a million German troops were besieging the Russian city of Stalingrad, gateway to the Caucasus. Eighth Army troops would have to be found to defend the new front. Churchill, however, was determined that no troops would be withdrawn from the desert until such time as Rommel was defeated once and for all. He urged Auchinleck to attack immediately. The 8th Army was exhausted and badly in need of a rest. Auchinleck judged that the earliest he could re-engage with Rommel was mid-September, six weeks away. What uh, Churchill wanted was, as always, a, an early offensive back against Rommel. He, would, he wanted the, uh, Rommel to be attacked without delay and thrown out of Egypt and what Auchinleck and, and Dorman Smith told him very frankly, frankly, candidly and bravely was that this was absolutely impossible. The Eighth Army could not be retrained, re-equipped and fit for a major offensive before probably September time. But Churchill's mind was already made up. Auchinleck and Dorman Smith were to be sacked. Churchill really wants to draw a line under the era of defeat. And really, from a political point of view, one of the best ways of doing that is by clearing out the old regime and replacing it with a new one. So in many respects, uh, Auchinleck is sacked for highly political reasons rather than for any failure on the battlefield. Uh, after all, uh, he had stopped Rommel. Auchinleck had made mistakes, and as Commander-in-Chief, he was ultimately responsible for the disasters at Gazala and Tobruk. But he had inflicted the first ever defeat on Rommel, a crusader, and he and Chink had stopped Rommel at El Alamein. By firing them both, Churchill ensured to this day that the achievements of these two Ulstermen were virtually forgotten. Human beings are really cannibals. We've given up eating one another physically, but we feed on one another in every other sort of way. And when everything concentrates on war and military personalities, the feeding becomes particularly foul. For Dorman Smith, the blow was particularly cruel. His reputation was savaged, and fellow soldiers spoke darkly of his supposedly pernicious influence on Auchinleck. Auchinleck had most of the qualifications to make one of the finest commanders, but unfortunately he lacked the one most important of all, the ability to select men to serve him. The selection of Dorman Smith as his chief advisor contributed most to his downfall. When the army drops you, it really drops you. There is no more chilling a feeling even here in the desert.
Humiliation would certainly be uh, an apposite word. He felt disappointed, I've no doubt. Uh, he felt, in a sense, insulted, because having saved the situation uh, for the future, to be then peremptorily dismissed and then blamed for the faults of others is what I think really hurt him. After, when he came back, he was sarcastic, angry, bitter, humiliated. And somebody took him aside and he said, listen, Chink, to get on, you have to employ the arts of mutual flattery, concession, compromise. And without that, um, you will not advance. Chink said, well, in that case, I'm finished. I'm doomed because I can't do that. The Ulsterman, who could justly claim to have played a major role in turning the Second World War in Britain's favour, was sent home, disgraced. To replace Auchinleck, Brooke eventually persuaded Churchill to settle on another Ulsterman. His command of the Eighth Army was to be amongst the most celebrated and controversial in British military history. I hold the view that the leader must know what he himself wants. He must see his objective clearly and then strive to attain it. It is necessary for him to create what I would call atmosphere. And in that atmosphere, his subordinate commanders will live and work. The family of Bernard Montgomery, Britain's most famous wartime general, was Ulster to the core. And though he wandered and travelled for much of his childhood and adult life, from Tasmania to Tripoli, Monty always considered himself a Donegal man. Well, Monty was basically an Irishman. I mean, his family went back uh, um, hundreds of years uh, to the 17th century in Ireland. But he was always in trouble. His mother's refrain was, go and find out what Bernard is doing and tell him to stop it. <laughs> uh, he was always getting to, into trouble, uh, mischief, uh, playing with knives, uh, uh, bullying girls, uh, you know, people l l less strong than he was. Bernard Law Montgomery was one of nine children to Henry and Maud Montgomery. And Henry was an Anglican bishop here in Moville, County Donegal. The future Viscount Alamein had a childhood of battles with his parents because they wanted him to become a clergyman and he was determined to become a soldier. It wasn't the first time he would disobey authority and it wouldn't be the last time he'd get away with it. But Montgomery's abrasiveness and self-confidence meant that he's hardly the most popular soldier in the British Army. It was just felt that he was too big for his boots and um, particularly when Winston Churchill became Prime Minister, Churchill realised that, you know, Monty was a difficult character and he didn't really like him. He, apparently he said, you know, he, of Monty, he's a little man on the make. In many respects, he was very, very skilled as a military commander. But perhaps, uh, I think, because of the intensity that he brought to his military life, and perhaps because of this huge self-confidence that he possessed, there was a certain narrowness uh, to Montgomery. He believed he had uh, all of the answers. And I think it's that certain narrowness to his perspective um, that w was one of his greatest flaws, not only as a commander, but, but as a human being. During the years away from battle, Montgomery was developing a comprehensive theory of warfare. During the First World War, as a young officer, he had never seen his generals, and he never felt close to those whose orders he was following. He resolved to develop a unique style of command that would link the commander with the troops as never before. He was absolutely determined that in modern warfare, a real military commander would have to be able to transmit his personality, to communicate with his troops. And after all, it's the men who have to fire the actual guns. 
bottled up in men are great emotional forces which have got to be given an outlet in a way which is positive and constructive and which warms the heart and excites the imagination. If the approach to the human factor is cool and impersonal, then you achieve nothing. But if you can gain the confidence and trust of your men and they feel their best interests are safe in your hands, then you have in your possession a priceless asset and the greatest achievements become possible. Montgomery called this technique the projection of personality. He believed he would get a better response from his men if they had some kind of personal connection with him, however fleeting. When I spoke to my men in the Royal Irish on the eve of the Iraq war, I was trying to do what Montgomery did, to connect directly to the men under my command. Nowadays, we call it communication skills. In 1942, it was brilliant and innovative leadership. But Montgomery's role in the events in the desert in 1942 is clouded more than ever in controversy. The contention is this. Montgomery's reputation as the savior of the desert campaign is undeserved. It was the orc who was in fact the architect of Rommel's downfall. But he's never received credit for this, quite simply because Montgomery was determined to steal all the glory for himself and thereby erase Auchinleck's part in history. I think after the war, um, British historians uh, felt uncomfortable First of all, with Monty's egoism, <laughs> you know, kept writing these books about the Second World War, in which he basically said he won the war. The problem with Monty in his memoirs and his other books on the Desert Campaign, to, not to be perfectly blunt, is that he's a liar. And, and he has claimed credit for things that actually belong to Auchinleck. He was the conquering hero who arrived and sorted out the mess. And in order to make that uh, as simple as possible, he'd exaggerated the mess. <laughs> it was a desolate scene. A few trucks, no mess tents, work done mostly in trucks or in the open air in the hot sun, flies everywhere. The whole atmosphere of the army headquarters was dismal and dreary. The magnitude of the task in front of me was beginning to become apparent. Montgomery wasn't impressed with Auchinleck's choice of location for headquarters. It selected the hottest, most fly-blown part of the desert, and Montgomery believed this was bad for morale. So, as the new commander of the 8th Army, he decided to relocate here, Borg Al Arab, on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. It's easy to see why Montgomery believed the morale in 8th Army was low uh, when he arrived. Um, the Army had been lacking a commander for over a week. They had just fought for over three months uh, in some of the most intense battles of the Second World War. 8th Army needed a breathing space. It needed some period of time in which it could rest uh, and refit. Montgomery's assertion that morale was fitly low in the 8th Army was only the first of a series of disagreements he had with Auchinleck. Of far greater significance was his assertion that Auchinleck was about to abandon the Nile Delta and retreat across the Suez Canal. Orkin Lake explained to me his plan of operations. Plans were being made to move the 8th Army HQ back up the Nile. I listened in amazement to this exposition of his plans. I asked one or two questions, but I quickly saw that he resented any question directed to immediate changes of policy about which he had already made up his mind. So I remained silent. One of the more hurtful charges and totally incorrect that Monty made against Auchinleck was that, uh, that Auchinleck was intending to retreat if Rommel were to attack again on the Alamein position. Now that is absolutely totally false. The plans did exist. Monty wasn't inventing that. How seriously were these plans taken? Well, that's a very difficult thing to judge. And the only way I could really judge that was to interview the, as many of the surviving 
uh, fighting generals and staff officers uh, from that time. All of them, there was, there was no exception, all of them were looking behind them all the time for the next place to retreat to. Well, if you've been retreating 1,500 miles, that's pretty, pretty natural. Well, Montgomery claims that there was a cast iron plan uh, to retreat from the positions at Alamein if Rommel attacked. And indeed there was, um, but it wasn't actually the main plan that was animating Eighth Army uh, at the time. It's a matter of public record that Auchinleck did have a plan to withdraw to Cairo and beyond if necessary, but this was very much a worst case scenario. As Commander-in-Chief Middle East, his intention was to protect the oil fields of Iraq and Iran and to stop them falling into Rommel's hands. And he knew to do this, he needed an effective army in the field. Whilst planning for victory, he was covering his back just in case. On the 14th of August, Montgomery addressed his staff. And Monty came out stood on the steps of these caravans, and then he gave this incredible speech, which must be one of the great speeches of history. And it was all in this rather schoolboy language of, we're not going to be defeated by this man. There's no reason to be defeated. We have everything in our favor. And he exaggerated, you know, he said, well, we've got hundreds of tanks coming from America. There's no reason to be frightened of this little German general or whatever. Well, the tanks weren't due to arrive for several months, but, you know. And uh, it was just conveying a sense of confidence that he would knock Rommel for six out of Africa. That address by Montgomery will remain one of my most vivid recollections. It was one of his greatest efforts. We all felt that a cool, refreshing breeze had come to relieve the oppressive and stagnant atmosphere. We all went to bed that night with a new hope in our hearts and a great confidence in the future of our army. And when Winston Churchill visited a few days later, Montgomery was able to impress the Prime Minister with a detailed appreciation of the situation, as well as plans for his coming battles. Montgomery wasn't daft, whereas the Auk had met Churchill in the desert in a fly-blown tent and served him army rations. Montgomery received the Prime Minister here on the refreshing shores of the Mediterranean. And as the sun set, the teetotal Montgomery plied the much less teetotal Churchill with specially imported brandy. But the plans which Montgomery presented to Churchill and which Montgomery claimed as his own owe more than a little to the two Ulster soldiers, Claude Auchinleck and Eric Dorman Smith nor cast aside. The centerpiece of these plans was the defense of a ridge called Alam Halfa. In his memoirs, published after the war, Monty claimed credit for spotting this excellent defensive position. This is totally untrue because the, the ridge had been actually fortified with minefields by Auchinleck. That position was already in place before Monty arrived. So he's absolutely, uh, totally wrong for him to try to make out that he suddenly spotted how important it was. But if Montgomery cannot claim credit for deciding to fight Nalum Halfa, he can claim credit for radically altering Auchinleck's battle plan. Alam Halfa would be a static, defensive battle. When Monty went out to the forward uh, formations around Alam Halfa, where they said, well, you know, sir, you know, who will give the order for us to advance? And Monty said, no, there's going to be no order to advance. You are going to dig in there. The Germans are going to get a hell of a knocking. This is going to be a defensive battle, not an offensive battle. So in that sense, Monty was completely correct in saying he, he just totally changed the battle plan. And as Churchill finishes brandy here on the evening of the 19th of August, it was then that Montgomery revealed that he had no plans to attack Rommel until mid-September at the earliest. And this was the exact same timescale that had got the Auk and Dorman Smith sacked. Churchill swallowed his doubts along with his brandy.
Within a few weeks of taking charge, Montgomery had reinvigorated the 8th Army and completely won over the Prime Minister. He had severely damaged the reputations of Auchinleck and Dorman Smith in the process, but this didn't matter to Monty. He had a war to win. Montgomery was now in a better position than any previous 8th Army commander because the desert was now his ally. The large open spaces, which allowed Rommel to sweep round the British flanks, were constrained now to the south by the ridges and gullies. And also, the supply situation was much better for Montgomery because from Alam Halfa to my rear to the main port of Alexandria is less than 100 miles, but Rommel's supplies had to come from the port of Tripoli, and that's nearly 1,000 miles in that direction. Rommel didn't want to fight what would become known as the Battle of Alam Halfa. He was short on fuel and had been denied reinforcements by Hitler, who was concentrating all his efforts on the Eastern Front. Yet Rommel knew Montgomery was about to be reinforced. Once again, the great gambler threw the dice. On the night of the 30th of August, Rommel attacked. He had only 200 tanks and that was compared to the almost 800 available to Montgomery. But Montgomery refused the temptation to meet and engage his enemy. Instead, he ordered the 8th Army to dig in. Almost immediately, the German advance ran into trouble. The British minefields were much stronger than Rommel had anticipated, and this slowed down the panzers. The British remained static, and let the German attacks bounce off them. Montgomery makes absolutely certain that by holding a static defence, he doesn't make any mistakes, mistakes that Rommel uh, has been known to punish severely in the past. So by simply holding the al am Halfa ridge and allowing the fleets of bombers to go across, bombing the Axis positions beneath the ridge, Montgomery makes sure that the battle uh, turns out in his favour. The situation was now desperate for Rommel. He was trapped between the 8th Army here and the Alam Halfa Ridge, and to the south, the impassable Qatar Depression. The British also had total air superiority, and it looked like Rommel was finished. But Montgomery refused pursuit, and by the 6th of September, Rommel had regrouped and was safely back beyond the British minefield. Montgomery explained his reluctance to pursue Rommel by saying he had him exactly where he wanted him. He didn't want Rommel to withdraw completely because this was the best place to finally destroy him. And his intention was to do this in the next battle, which Montgomery had already planned out in his head. Less than a month after arriving in the desert, he had his first victory. A legend was born. Montgomery's planning for the next battle, now known as the Second Battle of El Alamein, was already well advanced. And he was a general now in complete control of his army. Tours of the troops were regular occurrences where Montgomery predicted victory at every opportunity. The troops must be brought to a state of wild enthusiasm before the operation begins. They must have that offensive eagerness and that infectious optimism which comes from physical well-being. They must enter the fight with the light of battle in their eyes and definitely wanting to kill the enemy. In achieving this end, it is the spoken word that counts, from the commander to his troops. In some senses, this projection of personality then, it was almost Montgomery's recreation of himself into a symbol um, of the fighting spirit of the Eighth Army. It wasn't necessarily Montgomery's real personality, uh, but as this projection grew, he almost took on the characteristics of the projection so that it was difficult to know where the symbol of the victorious army commander and the real Bernard Montgomery uh, began and ended. Montgomery was building up significant advantages over Rommel. He had 220,000 men at his disposal, as opposed to 96,000 for Rommel. 
he had 1,100 tanks, which included at last the new American Sherman tanks, the Rommel's 200. Rommel was painfully low on both munitions and fuel, and the supply lines were at breaking point. Montgomery's battle plan at the second El Alamein was quite unlike the lightning fast maneuverist warfare of the previous 18 months. In many respects, it was a First World War offensive, totally attritional. It would open with a massive bombardment which would pound the Germans and soften their formidable defences. Then infantry on foot would cross the minefields, sometimes five miles deep, clearing mines by hand so that the armour could follow up behind. On the flanks, north and south, 8th Army formations would gnaw away at German defences in what Montgomery called crumbling operations. Montgomery named his battle plan Operation Lightfoot. In the early hours of the 23rd of October, the Great 8th Army artillery bombardment began. It was the biggest British bombardment since the First World War. Slowly, lit only by the moon and the artillery fire, the infantry of the 8th Army edged westwards across the minefield. The paths they cleared were wide enough for only one tank. This area that we're in now is still one of the most heavily mined areas in the world. There's literally millions of mines on either side of us. It's still not actually safe to leave the tarmac road. Montgomery hoped that his infantry could clear a lane through the minefield in 12 hours. In actual fact, it took nine days. Of course, the battle didn't go exactly according to plan. The, the armor never did get through these minefields. It got stuck in the minefields, and then they got the hell knocked out of them uh, and lost a lot of men. There was virtually a mutiny at one point in the battle, and the armoured commanders, who you become very fond of your men, and you, you just can't see them being, you know, torn up in that way. And uh, so they went to Monty and said, you know, we, we're not going to do this. And Monty was ruthless, and he said, you are. You have to do it. You know, if it's difficult for you, how much more difficult is it for the Germans? Montgomery was nothing if not resolute, and this is where he made the difference. Many commanders would have panicked at this stage, concluded their plan hadn't worked and withdrawn, but Montgomery resolved to stay. He knew he had overwhelming superiority, both in troops and armor over Rommel, and he's determined to make that count. He decided to refocus his attack to the north, to try to pin Rommel against the coast. This operation would be known as Supercharge. By the time Montgomery launched Operation Supercharge on the 1st of November, the second battle of Al Alamein was nine days old, and Rommel's men hadn't been reinforced for seven of those. Exhausted, low on fuel, and bombarded from the air and land, Rommel's once mighty Panzer Army fought its last set-piece battle here in these very sands. Now Rommel fought perhaps his most skillful battle, organizing a retreat against tremendous odds and slipping away from Montgomery into the desert. The war in the desert, which only three months previously had looked lost, had ended in a decisive British victory. The Second Battle of El Alamein is one of the most famous victories in British military history. It takes its place alongside Blenheim, Trafalgar and Waterloo in the pantheon of British military endeavour. Arguably, it was the battle that secured Montgomery's place in history. And for many people, Churchill included, it was the turning point of the Second World War.
the importance of the Battle of Alamein was not only that the Allies beat Rommel and destroyed a German army, it was what that meant to people. You know, it gave them a new sense of confidence that victory would come. You know, they rang the church bells for a very good reason for the first time in World War II. Churchill commented, it might almost be said, that before Alamein we never had a victory, and after Alamein we never had a defeat. The important word here is almost, because the 8th Army did have a victory before Monty's Alamein. They had a victory in Operation Crusader, and they had a victory in the First Battle of Alamein. But such was the force of Monty's character, and such was his glittering career thereafter, that his Alamein has become the only one that seems to matter. Almost. The achievement of, of Auchinleck and Dorman Smith was, was never properly appreciated, but afterwards uh, they were denigrated by, by Monty. It wasn't necessary. Montgomery would have had his own accolades for the success of, of, of Second Alamein, but to denigrate and deliberately denigrate those who had gone before uh, was a sad mistake. It was historically inaccurate. You know, historians later felt that he was so egotistical, so boastful, so vain, he was taking too much credit for what he'd done, and that uh, Auchinleck would have done more or less the same. As a historian who interviewed the commanders and, and uh, surviving commanders and staff officers from that time, I'm afraid that is rubbish. You can see why it's important for Montgomery to actually distance himself at the time from the previous command, uh, to, to discredit them uh, and to say that he's now the man in charge and that he will lead them to victory. Perhaps the problem is that Montgomery not only continues to follow that line, but perhaps begins to believe his own propaganda and can't, even after the war, acknowledge the debt he owes uh, to his predecessors because he's become so much engaged with the personality that he's uh, created. The desert is a tough place to fight and things aren't always what they seem here. 60 years after these Ulster generals fought their epic battles in these hard, hot, unforgiving sands, uncertainty still surrounds the reputations each carried for the rest of their lives. What isn't in doubt is that these men fought and won the battles that saved the world from tyranny. And as an Ulster soldier myself, that makes me very proud.